اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قال رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحل العقدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ادعو الى سبیل ربکا بالحکمت والموئزت الحسن وجادلہم باللتی هی احسن صدق اللہ العظیم My respected brethren, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To the listeners on YouTube, on Zoom, uh, to my brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to the second series of our, uh, of our course on comparative religion. Inshallah, I hope the last one, everyone learns something. Like I said, I'm also a student. I'm learning every day from children at school, from elders. So I am a student of uh, discovering new things every day. Uh, when you are quoting from the Holy Quran, like I said last week, we have, I use the Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation because the English is impeccable. As I said last time, that uh, there was a journalist, he said, I, my English improved tremendously. And I was uh, going through YouTube last night and I was getting some feedback from, uh, from Arabs. And one of the guys said that, you know, my English has improved tremendously by reading the translation of the Quran. I'm able to communicate. I had a brother from uh, Saudi Arabia some time back and he asked me, how do I improve my English? You know, my English is not very good. I'm a teacher in some way in northern part of Saudi Arabia. How do I improve my English? I said, you have it. The Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation will help you improve your English. So Alhamdulillah, he, when he went back to school, he said, you know what, you are absolutely right. The Arabic, uh, the translation of the, uh, the Quran, the Abdullah Yusuf Ali is very, very good. The language, you know, very eloquent. The choice of words. You know, improves your speech. When you are quoting from the Quran, it is very, very important that you share the verse number, chapter number with your audience or with the individual because at the end of the day, you don't want to misquote and also you want to share this knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want the individual to also go and check it up. Not that you are doubting the speaker. No, no, no. You go and check it up. For example, I quoted the first uh, verse that I quoted was from Surah Taha. I said, how do you find Surah Taha? Very, very easy. At the back, there is a very comprehensive index. Under H, you'll see uh, under T, Taha, like a dictionary, it's, uh, it's in alphabetical order. You check it up. It's chapter 20, verse 25. A prayer of Prophet Moses. Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. And this prayer I use in all my talks. Even you, even you, when you are delivering the message, when Moses was instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go and deliver the message to, uh, to Pharaoh, Moses was a stammerer, a stutterer. You know, his speech was broken. You know, you, you met people who stammer. So he made a dua to Allah or this dua that we learned as a da'i, qala rabbi shrah li sadri. Oh my Lord, expand for me my breast. Make me bold, you know. Not a heart operation, but make me bold. And make my task easy for me. And remove the impediment from my speech so that they may understand what I say. So when you are giving the, the message, when you are delivering, always remember this verse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you in your deliberation in your interaction. So remember Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 25. And the second uh, verse that I had recited is from Surah an nahl chapter 16, verse 125, where it says, invite all to the ways of the Lord with beautiful preaching and wisdom. You know, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna touch on that. How do you preach with uh, 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 the message with beautiful preaching and wisdom? So last week we started off uh, with the course on comparative religion and the need for comparative religion. 
we went to, I think we, I spoke over, uh, over two and a half hours. That was the longest I've spoken for. And uh, it's Allah who helps. You know, some of the things I said when I was going through the YouTube video, I didn't realize that I said those things. Remember, your words and your actions must be one. You know, they say practice what you preach. It's very, very important as a da'i. Because end of the day, you don't want to tell somebody about the Quran says, Ya ayyuhallazin, bismillah, Ya ayyuhallazin amunu, innam alhamru wal me. Most certainly intoxicants and gambling, and you are the guy that gambles. You're preaching something, but you're practicing something else. I remember there was a, a father, he went to this wise man. He went to this wise man and he told the wise man that, you know, I have a problem. I am a very, very simple laborer. I do not have enough money to make a living. And my son, he loves chocolates. And he cries for chocolates. And I cannot afford to give him chocolates. So he went, he presented his case to this wise man. He said, this is a problem I'm having. I don't know what else to do. So the wise man told him, you come back in three months and I will give you an answer. Come back in three months and I will give you an answer. So after three months, he goes back to the wise man and he tells the wise man, you know, I'm here now, I need an answer. I cannot afford. So the wise man, he looked at the young man and he said, my dear son, your father earns a meager salary. He's not earning much. So I want you to stop eating chocolates. And the young boy said, I will listen to you, Chef. So before he could leave, the father is asking the Chef, he said, three months ago I came and I asked you to give him advice. You told me to come back after three months. He said, what must I do? Because I myself loved eating chocolates. I had to train myself from refraining to eat chocolates so that I could give him advice. So you practice what you preach. Very, very important. When you practice what you preach, your job becomes very easy. Very, very easy. It fits like a puzzle. Everything fits together. So we have to, number, the characters, as I said, you practice what you preach. Number one, or the other point that we need to mention is that you need to have an impeccable character and a caring attitude. I think it was Sheikh Saad, he, they asked him, how did, you, how did you learn manners? How did you? He said, I learned it from the unmannerly. You know, that he, he does something bad, I say, I'm not going to do that. He speaks like, I'm not going to do that. So whatever bad traits he has, I'm going to do the opposite. So I learned my character and I polished my character by looking at the unmannerly. So people are going to look at you. They are going to point their finger at you. This guy is talking about da'wah, but he doesn't go for salah. You know, it's, it's, a na it's a nature of man to find faults. To find faults. So very, very, very important because Remember, you are the ambassador of Islam. You know, you are representing. When you are going out in the field, I know this is my full-time job is an educator. Dawa is after hours, I do a little bit of research and so on. So I earn my salary from my profession. Many of you all are students, maybe inshallah when you all get on, you will be working and you're going to use Dawah as your backup as well. You're going to help to propagate Islam and so on. So remember, your priority is your job and secondly is your, the message that you are going to deliver. So I am, as much as I'm a professional teacher, I also, also have to represent Islam on a different forum. I have to be an ambassador to Islam. In your work environment, you know, I am blessed to be the only Muslim teaching in this, in this school. It's like an international school. And Alhamdulillah, when decisions are, are being, uh, or when people want to, uh, an answer for something, and Alhamdulillah, they come and ask me. They say, Brother Abzal, what have you to say about this? Can we have your input? You know? I remember there was a, 
uh, a guy came to me and said, you know what, I, uh, my wife passed on and um, what should I do? He, he happens to be a pastor. He said, what should I do? So I told him that you should get married. He said, no, I, I, I can't get married because who will I have there on the second, you know, when I, when I die, who will be my wife, the first one or the second one? And Alhamdulillah, Allah just helps. You know, it, it, just, it just helps. So I said, what did Jesus, peace be upon him, say? He says, uh, what do you mean? I said, what did he say? You must, you have to ask him. I said, when they, were, they came to him with a pose and they asked him, Master, uh, this woman, she was married to this Jew. He passed on. And it is customary amongst the Jews that if he had a brother, she must marry him. It so happened that this guy had seven brothers and all of them died. So they asked, uh, they asked him, who shall she have there? I'm, na I'm narrating to him this. So they're asking him, who shall we have there? So he said, and what did Jesus say? He said, neither shall they die anymore. They will become equal unto the angels. Meaning they will live in a spiritual world. They will not have the needs of this world. I said, that's your answer. Follow him, you get married. And Alhamdulillah, he's looking for a wife. If there are any possible candidates here, let me know, <laughs> inshallah. We'll get this guy married and we'll bring him into the deen. So it is very, very important, your attitude in which you present yourself. And Alhamdulillah, and Whatever he asks for the past, he comes and asks me. He says, how do I, you know, I'm giving this talk. What should I say? How should I present? I said, this is what you do. Because I have a caring attitude. Sincere. You know, as I said before, one of the things that you, when you're doing dawah, you must be sincere. You must uh, care for your brother. Whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, you must care. They're all the, uh, they're the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the Jews feel that they are the chosen people, they are above the rest, you know. We must not be like that. We are all compassionate and caring. We are from the children of Ishmael and Islam. You know, we are compassionate, caring. We forgive. We forgive. We turn the other cheek. That is the nature. You know, you might have issues on certain things, but we, at the end of the day, we forgive. So, as I said, it's very important to have a good character and a caring attitude because at the end of the day uh, you will win an argument you will win the your the the your the the, the love and affection of the person you are talking just by looking at these guys you know and this guy admitted wallahi admitted he said if there was no religion as christianity i would have become a muslim today because of your good character wallahi he said that he said that he had a meeting with his members in his church and he was telling them if there was no religion as Christianity, I would have accepted Islam because of Afzal, because of his good and caring character. So very, very important. As, as I said, you can empower yourself by reading. Very, very important because when you speak, uh, you are you need communication skills. You must read. No, a magazine. As I said, the little notes I make. You make those little notes. You keep them in your pocket. You learn verses. You have a magazine. You carry a bag. You must read. When you read, it's like a window to the world. You empower yourself. You learn any any subject matter. I was. Um, I had uh, taken uh, occupation of a new class and I was going through uh, the teacher that left. She, uh, she happened to be Mrs. White. So she left, she's gone to Australia. Well, like, when I opened her cupboard, she only had books. I, I was embarrassed. She had books and on books and books with a little marker there and highlighting uh, the pages. You have to read. You have to make reading a religion. I'm, you know that you have to make it a duty to read. We don't read. We always, as I said, we listen from hearsay. 
that this guy said that and this guy that. By the time it passes you, it's diluted. The message becomes something else. You have to read to empower yourself. Number two, you have to rely on Allah. Number one, uh, you have to, re that the first thing you must remember that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides. We are just a mouthpiece. You know, so, so many people ask me, hey, how many people came to Islam? I said, I don't know. In all your talks, and did, did anyone come to Islam? I said, I don't know. Because the help comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is mentioned in the Holy Quran, I think chapter 28, verse 56. I think this will be put up on the, on, I think on the website or some notes, so you can have access to this. So it is mentioned uh, that uh, to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, Indeed, O Muhammad, you do not guide whom you like, but Allah guides whom He wills, and He is most knowing of the rightly guided. Chapter 28, verse 56. If you make that your basis, maybe you spoke to somebody and they disagree and they disagree, but later on you have planted the seed and Allah will, subhanahu will germinate it. You just planted the seed, you created a doubt in this guy. You have created a doubt, you planted the seed. I was speaking to, a, uh, to an atheist uh, a, a few days ago. So I'm asking this lady, what do you believe? She said, I believe uh, in nothing. I believe in free spirit. Everything has like a cause and effect. I just believe in that. I said, you have to believe in something. She said, no, I, I don't believe. So I said that the way in manner in which you can handle her is Quran and science. And we have literature. I think there are books here. There are books on internet. Just learn a few uh, scientific facts when you are discussing with an atheist and present it to him. They can't deny you. They cannot deny the scientific facts. So I said I will present you with some information on science and the science can talk to you. And where did we get this information? 1400 years ago, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a revelation that came to him and it speaks about science. She said, I, I didn't know that. Uh, did your, does your Quran speak about science? I said, yes, it speaks about science. It speaks about science and then uh, you can uh, read through it and you make up your mind. There was a, uh, many years ago, there was an atheist. He came to me and he said, you know, I, uh, I asked, what do you believe? He said, I believe in nothing. I believe in the union. You know, I believe in what I see, I believe. I believe in nothing. I said, uh, did you read uh, Quran and science? He says, uh, no. What do you mean science and Quran and science? I said, no, there's a book I have. I want you to read it. And uh, you come and make up your mind and decide what you want to do. So after a few weeks, I gave him the book. He came back to me. He says, do you have anything more? So I said, what do you mean? So I gave him the biography of Prophet Muhammad. So he went, he read that. And after some time, I didn't see him. After about six months, he came back to me. Uh, he's telling me, I have read the Quran. I said, what do you mean you read the Quran? He said, I read the Quran in Arabic. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, I went to study Arabic. I learned Arabic, so I read the Arabic in the language that it was revealed in, and I read the translation, I read the whole Quran. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed because here is a youngster who went out of his... But You know, you can go and read the translation. If you just come into the deen, you probably you're going to start reading the translation. He went and studied Arabic, read Arabic, learned the... Uh, read the translation. Plus, he gave me... <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell... He gave me uh, a little uh, DVD on how to uh, read Arabic. You know the, the rules of Arabic, he gave me, he said, you, sir, you go study this and probably you can read the Quran in the language that it was revealed with understanding. I, I was embarrassed. Well, I, here is the guy. And Alhamdulillah, today he's, a, he's into the field of, uh, of some science at one of the top, you know, I think he's qualified now. He from an atheist to a Muslim. And he took Shahada, I think, at, at the Amslanga Masjid here in Durban. And uh, whenever I see him, he says, sir, I'm... Uh, I'm a practicing Muslim. Thanks to you, Quran and science did the job. So it is Allah who does the job, not you. I just gave the book. 
I, I didn't speak a, I didn't speak a word about science. I just gave the book and he's a, he's a scholar in science today. How much more he's understanding the Quran more than me, you, because he's reading it with understanding and he's able to discuss. He says, I use the Quran and explain now. He's the top scientist in the country. So it is, remember, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides. Right? So are, are you guys with me so far? Is no. you're not lost? You know, I always say to the boys in my <laughs> class, I hope you don't become like the Titanic. You know, sometimes I'll have to look for you somewhere in the back. You have to send submarines to get you out. Maybe you lost. So I hope you guys are with me. To those who maybe just joined the Zoom or YouTube, uh, welcome to this uh, lesson on comparative religion. You have, do you have any questions thus far? Because it's difficult for me to just talk and talk and talk. I need some feedback. Is there any questions you have so far that you want to share? Then I can just share with the listeners and out there. Something that I can just add on to. It. Any questions that you have so far? Okay, so right, we move on. <clears throat> A next point of a uh, of a da'i is patience. You must have patience. Um, if you think that uh, you have, you are armed. You are armed with knowledge of scriptures and books, and you're gonna go out there, and uh, you're just gonna ramble away, and people are going to uh, believe, you know, listen to you. You're gonna probably gonna have that antagonistic approach, you know. And, you know, you're going to throw something at them, they're going to throw something at you. It's not going to work. Believe you, with all that knowledge, you'll become like a donkey carrying that load. You know that, as I said, even the donkey does not know the load it's carrying. With all that knowledge, it's like useless. Useless. You have to have patience. You, you must approach um, uh, this... Uh, this uh, message with patience. You know, there is this uh, belief that Islam was spread with the point of the sword. You know, they said that uh, Thomas Carlyle said, the sword indeed, but where will you get this sword? You know, they said Islam was spread by the point of the sword. If you have this book, uh, I think it's by Shad Gilad, it's got quotations from Thomas Carlyle about uh, what people said about Muhammad in uh, about his character, about his leadership. You know, they, ex they said that he spread Islam at the point of the sword. It was not so. It was one man against all men that he might take the sword and propagate with it. It will do little for him. You must first get your sword, that sword of the intellect, that which will propagate by itself. The sword of the intellect, of hikmah. That verse that I had recited from Surah al nahl chapter 19, chapter B. I spoke to you about the B last week. So, you, out of curiosity, go check up about bees. How they find their way, how they navigate using the sun to the flowers. It's amazing how the bees can navigate using the, uh, the points of the sun to go and look for their nectar. It's amazing. You can, can see the von Frisch. He discovered that bees use a pattern. And how they build that hexagonal pattern of the, of the hive, of that, uh, you know, the honeycomb. It's amazing. How did they do it? An intelligent bee. And there are hadiths uh, from Sahih Bukhari about uh, the narrations of the bee. You go and check it up. You know, you go and check it up. Learn it. Go and study about ants. The, the Quran speaks about, about ants, about spiders. Surah Al Ankabut, about the spider's web. The most flimsiest of the house is the spider's web, but yet it's able to trap the enemies. Go and check it out. About the scientific principles of insects in the Quran and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the analogy of the insects to draw your attention to the uh, to to Islam and to the message. He uses insects. You want to become an expert in that field, go and study the entire on insects. Tell me about birds. 
and, and so on. You become a master in that field. So when we're having a discussion, we call this brother, you deal with this. You're dealing with the atheist, now tell him about what you know about ants, about insects. Because remember, as I said, you, some of you all may have full-time professions, and your job also as a Muslim is to do da'wah. So you can, have, you can arm yourself with one field of study, with one field of study, and you can present it. You can become an expert. <coughs> so chapter 16, uh, verse, uh, that verse that I had recited was from chapter 16, verse 125. It said that invite people with wisdom uh, and beautiful preaching. So the Prophet tells them, they say, it was one man against all. Imagine he was the first one. He started up with one individual saying, La ilaha illallah. One individual. Then his wife, his wife Khadija, two. And then it went to three, and then to four, and to five. Today, over how many? How many Muslims in the world? 1.6 billion? Is it somewhere around there? One th is it is it right? One third of the people of the population are Muslims. Check it out. You need to know statistics. So, so the brothers want to know what is your topic. What what's a? Okay, these are the character traits of a da'i. We're moving on. The character traits of those who joined us is the character traits of a da'i. Right. So you need to. Um, have patience when you are focusing on as a diet. Then you need to be thoughtful and have, you need to, to take into consideration the backgrounds of people. Remember, sometimes if you watch speakers that are giving talks on Islam, maybe at Q&A, it's a difficult. Believe you me, at Q&A it's difficult. You need to know your subject matter. But Alhamdulillah, as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He helps. So, one of the things that you need to ask individuals, that when you, tell me about your background. So maybe you're speaking to a Hindu. So probably you can speak from his point of view. You're speaking to a Christian. So probably you can address him from his point of view. You're speaking to an atheist. So probably you can speak to him from his point of view. So you have to take into consideration the state of the person who you are interacting. What background does he have? You must know that. Because some people don't know anything. Believe you me, there are more atheists in the world than believers. Go check it out. There are so many people that don't believe in anything. Over the years that I have been interacting with students, many of them say we don't believe. We don't believe in anything. We just, you know, just we believe in uh, uh, tomorrow comes and goes like day and night, day and night. We don't believe in it. We don't believe in supernatural things. We don't do that. So there are many people that don't believe in anything. So you have to have an idea about who you are interacting with. Okay, so very importantly is to ask the individual what is your background. Okay, and then you will see the results because you are speaking to him from his background. Very, very important. And uh, you must be passionate. You know, for seven years, people always ask me, what do you gain from sitting with a man who cannot speak? He's paralyzed from the neck down. You can get nothing. What can you get from him? You're not getting uh, petrol dollars. You're just sitting with him. And uh, what do you gain uh, by sitting with him? A gentleman that cannot speak. I was passionate about, number one, I was passionate about taking care of the aged. That's my passion as well. I have this, Allah has given me this, uh, I studied a course on uh, alternate therapy and alhamdulillah many of my friends are the elderly. They are bedridden. So I go and seek advice, solace in the company. So they asked me, this man is sitting uh, sleeping here for nine years and for seven years you are sitting with him. He doesn't speak. What do you gain from him? I said to them, at least when I leave the bedside of Sheikh Ahmad Dida, he does not backbite me. He does not backbite me. You know, you and I will have a discussion here about Dawah. Say, hey, you know that guy, he doesn't know anything. He must still go and learn. We have, it's a nature. It's inborn. 
for us to bad mark our brothers. I said when I left his bedside, he did not bang by me. He only made duas with the blink of his eyes. That's all. I learned that one thing from him, and I gained that, that we should not bang by people. Bring our brother. As I said, many of us suffer with PhDs, put him down syndrome. That instead of picking the brother up, we'll boot him to the ground. You know, push him further into the dirt. Grind him. I said, learn from the unmannerly. One of the things you must learn is not, don't do that. The guy back, uh, uh, I'm not doing that. He's doing this, uh, uh, I'm not doing that. Sheikh Saad, he said, learn manners from the unmannerly. So remember that that you have to be passionate about what you do. If you came here to uh, win points like a boxing match and you drink dawah, then you are in the, in the wrong field. You're going to hurt the feelings of people. People are sensitive. They believe in something. Everybody believes. The Hindu believes, the Christian believes, the uh, atheist, he also believes in. He believes in nothing. You know? So, you have to be very, very passionate about what you do. You have to be consistent. We are looking at the character traits of a Dai. And uh, another point is that you have to be consistent. Um, remember that by me standing here, I was set up out of the blues. Brother Iqbal contacts me, he said, we're running a competitive course and uh, we want you to come, uh, you know, help us. I said, no, inshallah, I will do that. It's because I was consistent in what I was doing. It is as if Allah tickled his heart. He said, you know, you know that guy, you call this guy. You bring him, let him do the course. Because I was consistent and passionate about what I was doing. And the rest Allah does. He raises you up. He brings you up. So I'm standing here because in my field of that, I, I, will, I am consistent every day. I meet somebody, I'll speak to them about deen. I say, you know, the Quran speaks about this. You know, the Quran speaks about Christ, the son of Mary, in certain chapters. Did you know? I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, I didn't know that. I said, you have to be consistent with whatever you do. And uh, because when you are consistent, in what you do, then it will bring in the results that you want. It will bring in the results that you want, so that uh, it could be positive, it could be negative, you know. If you are criticized in your manner in which you are present, it's good. Because there is something that you are doing that brought about that criticism. If everyone says, Pat, you hey, very good, very good, it's being insincere, they are lying to you. Because when whatever you Whatever you say, the manner in which you approach things, there may be something that you'll say that will go against the norms and the values of those around you. So it elicits a reaction. And people say, hey, this guy is now he's interfering. He's interfering. Like I think somebody, uh, a preacher was uh, uh, preaching the Ten Commandments in a countryside church. And he said, thou shalt not steal. So everyone said, Amen. He said, thou shalt not steal eggs. Everyone said, Amin. He said, thou shalt not steal goats. Everyone said, Amin. He said, thou shalt not steal chickens. Then one guy said, hey, hey, stop it. You're interfering now <laughs> because he was a chicken thief. <laughs> so when it goes against the grain of people, then you're going to create reaction. Say, stop it now. Now you're interfering. So in this field of da'wah, you need to have a sense of uh, consistency in your approach to da'wah. As I said uh, in my introduction, I spoke about words and action. You have to, uh, your words and your actions must complement each other. You cannot speak about something and do the opposite. You know? You're preaching the Ten Commandments and you're doing something else. You can't do that. Because, uh, the, remember, the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greater the test. And it's proven in the, amongst the prophets of God that they do an immense test. I was um, on YouTube yes, last night and, uh, and somebody were making comments. They said that uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat is being punished for preaching against uh, the religions. He was being punished.
So I'm thinking that if he was being punished, then God will have to apologize to Prophet Job in the Bible, Old Testament. He will have to apologize to Prophet Job for testing him with his health, with his wealth, with his children. He will have to apologize to him because the closer you are to the Creator, the greater the test. Fine, in your life, if you think you're going through difficulties, ask yourself, am I closer or am I strained? The closer you are to the Creator, the better, the greater the test. So when God Almighty or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He puts you through a test, He is actually, uh, or when He's making things difficult for you, He's actually testing you. The level of your commitment, your consistency and so on. In Surah al nahl I said that you, it says invite all to the ways of thy Lord with beautiful preaching and wisdom. Now what is wisdom? You know, there's different ways in which it can manifest itself. Um, as I said, sometimes my, it could, be, it could uh, mean uh, something to you, it could mean something to me. Uh, wisdom for me is thinking on your feet. You know, it's, you think on your feet. You know, most of the times when people ask me about Islam, I don't quote scriptures and stuff. I don't use books. I'll be honest with you, I don't use the Bible, New Testament. And it's just out of the blues, something just happens and, you know, like the head computer, like a connection to the head computer and the answers just come. To me, that is wisdom. I remember um, the Sheikh, he used to work for one of the uh, a company is here, I think somewhere here in Durban, uh, Simplex. I think Simplex Furniture and stuff like that. So he used to, I think he was in the, uh, in dispatch. And they had a supervisor. So the supervisor, uh, he noted that every time, on occasion at lunchtime, the chef used to disappear. You know, lunch break. So these guys disappeared one day. Now. So one day they were busy, and uh, the chef happened to be uh, out, and he came about five or ten minutes late back to work. So the supervisor said, "Hey, Mr. D, that you know you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to leave the company premises, uh, and uh, uh, you know it's it's unethical." He said, "Where did you go?" So he said, "No, I went for a haircut." So he said, Mr. Dhead, you need to have your hair cut your time. So the chef replied, he said, but sir, the, my hair grew during company time. It grew during company time. So that's a battle of the woods, you know? So wisdom, there was nothing, no books, nothing. It's just a battle of the woods. Wisdom. You need to have, that is one of the, I think one of the great traits of a die is to have wisdom. And the manner in which that you can acquire wisdom is by reading. You have to read. Without that expanding your knowledge, you are not going to uh, win the day. You have to read. And most, I'll be honest with you, some of the battles can be won with just with the words. Just with the words. I think uh, uh, Musa A.S. when he was uh, asked to go and uh, deliver the message of Tawheed to Pharaoh, and um, they said there was, he chose a specific day. You know, his wisdom was different, his approach was different. So he chose a specific day where people were in a state of relaxation. That was his wisdom. Okay? So probably, inshallah, uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him, gave him the wisdom. So he chose a day in which people were relaxed and there was no impediments in the attendance. So everyone was relaxed and listened to the message. So that was his approach to presenting the case for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and he chose a time of the day when everything was clear to the audience as to who was truly a messenger from Allah and he, and he was just and he was not a magician because people said he was a magician. Very, very importantly, uh, when you are speaking, 
is that you must repeat yourself at times. Because sometimes the guy don't, he won't catch it at the first hit. So you must remember, the Prophet Sallallahu when he used to deliver the message, sometimes he used to repeat his instruction three times. You know, he used to repeat, and he speaks uh, uh, slow, clear. Um, at the moment, there are many student teachers that, uh, that have come to our school, and many of them were attached to me. And the first thing that I tell them, that when you are speaking to your audience, you have to speak slow, number one. You have to speak a little louder than normal. You know, some of the students that come out, they're shy, they, you know, they, they speak um, uh, to the board, so the voice is projected away. You have to speak to the audience. You have to have a command of your audience. You speak slow, you speak clear, Okay, you speak loud because when you speak slow, your choice of words becomes selective. If you're gonna ramble around and you know, like 100 miles an hour, the guy said, What did he say? What did he say? You forgot, you maybe one or two people. He said this, he said that. And remember, <clears throat> in the time of the prophets, when they delivered the message, there were no microphones. There are no microphones, you know. Um, Jesus, peace be upon him, when he was addressing that, I think five thousand people, thousands of people, and 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 remember his uh, how his voice was projected, clear, audible speech. It was the help of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The message came out clear; people could listen. But I'm saying, if you can use that as a backdrop, that when you give the message, it must be clear, it must be audible. It must be loud and you speak slow because you can grasp the subject matter better. Maybe you know a little bit, a little of the subject matter, then you can add, you know, you can add and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He helps you and then the wisdom automatically comes because you are consistent, you are patient, your good conduct, all that is packaged and it gives you who you are and you address people. So it's important, think of a teacher when he's speaking, who, or go back in time and, and find out who was your favorite teacher. Why did I like him? I loved him because he said, he told us stories, he told us this, so we can relate to it. People like stories. If you look in the, in the Bible, in the, uh, in the Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet used to tell his stories. Yusuf, the uh, Surah Yusuf, and we relate to you the best of stories. People like stories. So you can package it. Interesting, you can package it. Even if you say something that went against the grain, against their view, they'll still remember this guy told me something and I remember, hey, this, this is great. This is great. I've learned uh, one of the methods that I, as an individual, uh, is doing dawah right now, I use um, uh, the WhatsApp. I use the WhatsApp. So I started making video clips. You can uh, you can use innovative ways of doing that one. I make video clips. Uh, it so happened that we were in lockdown in 2020. I think, I think in April. Or so, I mean, South Africa was in lockdown, and uh, our schools were closed. And I'm thinking, now what do I do? Because um, in my talks, I like to narrate lovely anecdotes because people can relate to that. Because remember, the average person, maybe about 30 minutes, he'll listen and then after that, he switches off. And when you are, going, when you are delivering a talk or when you are going for a talk, the first minute or two, the audience will decide whether he wants to listen to you or not. He's going to decide that first minute or two, he's going to decide, am I going to listen to this guy? Because in the manner in which he dangles that carrot, he wants to catch fish, the manner in which he presents his case will determine whether you are going to listen or not. Because people 
the drift, the mind is beyond your control. Even in your salah, when you're reading salah, you know, um, for, there was a guy that was, um, uh, I think he was reading salah. So and then after the salah, the, the musalli said, Imam, I think you missed one rakat. You made a mistake. You supposed to read four, you read three. So he's thinking now, oh, what? I think, no man, I read all my salah. He said, how can you prove it? He says, because in my first rakat, I have four shops. In my first rakat, I was thinking of my shop in Grey Street, whether they closed the shutters. In my second rakat, I was thinking of my shop in Isipino, whether the, uh, the Damascus were delivered. In my third rakat, I was thinking of the shop in Port Jepson, whether they put the burglar gun. In my fourth rakat, I was thinking about my other shop, whether that guy came to work. So I, I am sure I read my four rakat. So the mind is beyond your control. Even in Salat, you wonder now, you drift. So when you are, you have to have innovative ways to catch fish. You have to. And uh, as I said, I make these little video clips. And Alhamdulillah, I have pastors in the surrounding areas in, uh, of Durban. They use those clips in their counseling sessions. They said that clip in two minutes can do a better job than one hour of preaching. So when they counsel women, counsel children, so I speak about, about fault finding, don't backbite, you know, verses from the Quran, Bible, I use Bible as well, what the Bible says, what the Quran says, and uh, they're using it. And if I don't send them, uh, uh, it's, my phone has been troubling me recently, so I stopped for a few weeks. If I don't send them, their phone is said, you didn't send us a clip. Why didn't you send us a clip? I said, okay, inshallah, I will uh, probably. And the one that I gave, uh, mentioned to you about water last week, was an inspiration. I just sat down and I wrote and I made a clip on water and I sent it to them. I included, used Quran and Bible, I integrated both the religions and presented and they used it in the church, uh, in the counseling session. Then in the, in, the, in the field that I am in, in education, some of the clips are used in, uh, the, uh, in workshops on education. So as an introduction, uh, the facilitator, one of the facilities, uh, there are a few, they said, we use your clips in the workshops. I mean about teachers. You know, if you look at one of the most noble profession today is a teacher. I'm speaking to you on this platform because of my background. You know, it helped me all the years. I didn't know that it will be, it will culminate in me standing here. I didn't know that. I didn't know that I was going for training all the years, over 30 years I'm teaching, I didn't know every time that you are standing at this, I didn't know it was a practice that Alhamdulillah has culminated uh, for me to come here and help. Maybe, remember, as a Dai, when you are being, you are there to change one person, one person, man, not 10, 21. As I said, in the uh, years that I am uh, doing Dao, many have come to Islam. Many. And I didn't know until a, a sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, he's from Somalia, he was telling me, Brother Abzal, remember, you brought one person to Islam. For the next generation or the generations to come, inshallah, there will be many, many Muslims after that. And the duas and the sawab will come to you. I didn't know. I didn't. I just thought, hey, I, at least inshallah, that one person has come to deen. I did my job, but you don't know it has a ripple effect to people beyond your uh, understanding and comprehension. So one of the ways I said I use video clips, you can do that. Um, another friend of mine who's a teacher who teaches English, so she makes little uh, uh, quotations, thoughtful quotes. You go to uh, Google, you check, you got lovely quotes about parents, you can have quotes about children, you can use quotes about scripture, and you can post it, it will have a knock-on effect, it will go on to many people on different groups. You pass it to one, that girl pass it to another, there are groups and groups, and it circulates throughout, eventually you'll, somebody in, in Malaysia, somebody in Timbuktu, they'll read this guy, he said something about parenting, about parents. You know, Jesus said, honor thy mother and father. 
Anyone who dishonors them must be put to death. You know what a serious uh, statement that is? In Islam, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came uh, to Arabia, the women were disrespected. The girls were buried alive. They were buried alive. One statement, one statement raised the honor of the woman when he said that paradise lies at the feet of your mother. One statement. The entire perception of a woman flipped. That paradise lies at the feet of your mother. So if you can make little slogans, you inspire. You know, inshallah, maybe from this course, maybe there might be a great scholar that will rise. And I will be honored. Maybe in his heart he's passionate. He said, this is, I'm, this, is my, this is my calling that I want to do and I'm going to continue. I'm going to study. Remember I told you that a bird cannot fly on one wing. Remember that. It needs two wings. So you have knowledge about uh, secular education, knowledge about Islamic education, you can fly as high as the wind can take you. you know? So there are so that was, that was one method I, there may be other methods that you can uh, do da'wah. So, so as I said, there, the, uh, the manner in which we are present is going through YouTube, Zoom, all around. So this is one way in which you can do da'wah. And there's Instagram as well, you know. Uh, there's um, uh, other, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm 56 years old. And there are some of the things that the phone apps or you have on, on social media, I don't know. So some of the kids, they come and ask me teasingly, Hey, sir, are you on Instagram? We want to see a photo. Hey, sir, are you there? I said, no, I don't know. You know there's some, every day there's new apps that are being uh, produced. Uh, it makes life easy at your fingertips. At your fingertips. Okay? So when you have uh, this access to your to those apps, then the world it comes to you. You don't have to go to the world. Just in your in your lounge, in your home, you can just sit and you can interact with people worldwide. People want to know you make friends, and uh, they want to, and you ask them questions about life, and you 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 are able to share this. Beautiful deen, you know. The Prophet said, "Balli ho anni walau I deliver the message concerning me, even it be one verse, even it be one verse, you did the job. So you ask, meet strangers uh, on a bus or a plane, uh, and uh, you are doing business. You are doing business with Allah Subhanahu." You are doing good. Talking about a plane, um, I remember this one guy was a Muslim brother. He was in the plane and it was the time for the salah. So he went to the, uh, to the uh, toilet area. There was a basin there. And he started to do the ablution. He's making the wuzu. And then the stewardess came and said, that's filthy. That's unacceptable. That you are using the uh, the uh, basin to wash your hands, gather your mouth, wash your feet. It's filthy. So the guy said, "I must apologize." So he said to her, uh, "This is the manner in which we uh, do the wuzu, the evolution before we go, go and pray." She said, "But that's unacceptable. You can't put your feet." Uh, on the, in the basin, it's filthy. So the wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you wisdom. So he asked her, he says, how many times do you uh, wash your hands? How many times? She said, maybe twice. So how many times do you wash your face? Since once in the morning. He said, if that's the reason, then my feet will be cleaner than your face because I wash my feet five times a day. So it was the battle of the woods. I, my feet is cleaner than your face because I wash my feet five times a day when I go and pray. So it was like the battle of the woods. So she had no answer. So it was like 
thinking on your feet. So whenever you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets you up in the environment so that you uh, can, uh, sometimes you have to use the environment. You know, sometimes you have to use the environment. I was uh, speaking to a good friend of mine, uh, his name is Krish, Krish Naidu, and, um, and we were standing at his dispensary and from the door where there was a tree. So I'm asking him, Krish, you are here in this practice for maybe like about 25, 30 years, yes. I said, did you ever one day pause and look at the tree, how beautiful God has created the tree? He said, no, I didn't. I'll be honest with you, I didn't look out and admire the tree. You, you, you brought it to my attention. In, in future, I, you know, God willing, when I'm there, I will actually appreciate it. I said, look at the tree, how it uh, houses the birds. People are sitting under the tree for the shade. I said, did you ever think about that? He said, no, I never. I never ever look at the tree one day. So you use your environment sometimes when you are, when you are doing da'wah. You know? I was telling, uh, for example, Singapore is one of the cleanest countries in the world. You know Singapore? One of my students said, sir, I went to Singapore. You'll never find litter. You'll never find litter. You know, then you can use that example. Like, for example, on that, you say, you know, Islam teaches about personal hygiene. Wash, wash, wash. Always water, water, water. The person who is telling you to save, to use water, should be telling you to save water because he came from the from the Arab Peninsula or that area where there is no water, desert-like conditions. He's telling you to use it. Use water five times a day. He should be telling you save it. Don't use water. Use the environment to do da'wah. You can, as I said, the circumstances around you that will help you to get a better understanding. For example, uh, somebody is wearing a cross, you know the crucifix? Uh, I think it's mentioned in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. They said there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So it's like a manifestation. The cross is a is called a crucifix. It is like the uh, it is like the a pillar of of the Christian religion. That crucifix, and based on Christian, it uh, speaks about the divinity of Jesus Christ, and so on. So as I said, this verse that I quoted, one John five seven, memorize it. One verse a day, two, three, four, five. By the end, you will have enough verses from Quran and other scriptures to present your case. Learn one a day, two a day. As I said, that I also have to brush up because this is not my full-time job. I have to brush up, go and memorize. Last night I had to check cross the because it's not in my uh, in my field as a full-time prophet. It's not a full-time, so I have to go and brush up. And I'm a student. You must remember that the student cannot be greater than the master. Remember that one. That you have to learn a verse a day. One verse at a time. 1 John 5, 7. You know? So you go and study that, learn that verse. It becomes part of your knowledge. Like I shared it to many here in the class, on YouTube, on Zoom. So inshallah, welcome to the sisters. While we are waiting for them to say, any, are there any uh, questions you have so far? Maybe we can go. Uh, something that you want to share that we can share. Someone that you said, you know, I had this experience and, uh, and this is what I did. I can share it. Because everyone here is a student. We're all learning from each other. You know? So if there's something that you, you came across, you were on the streets and somebody mentioned something to you and then as I said the guy is wearing a crucifix you ask him what about you know what does the crucifix signify you start a conversation you start a conversation remember you are not there to hurt the feelings of people you're not, you're not there you are there comparative religion 
is to get an understanding of the different faiths so that we can come to common grounds. We can come to common grounds. You know? Um, I think it's mentioned in... Uh, I think you can ask him for something. Okay, so uh, the Quran says, I think this is the basis of comparative religion. When the Prophet came and he said, uh, in Surah, Ali, Surah uh, chapter 3, Ali Imran, Surah Ali Imran, as I said, those who came to find Surah Ali Imran in the Quran is difficult. We have translations like the one that we have here. So you can check up Imran and the I, you'll find that it's chapter 3, verse 64, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the lips of Prophet Muhammad, he says, Say, O people of the book, Kul ya ahla kitab ta'alu. I think this is the basis of comparative, comparative religion. Say, people of the book, ta'alu. He says, come to common terms as between us and you. Come, let us reason. What's the first thing? Allah na'budu illallah. That we worship none but Allah. <coughs> that we associate no partners with him. That we erect not from amongst ourselves, lords and patrons other than Allah. But if you turn your back, say, bear witness that we are Muslims who bow to God's will. I think that is the basis. Chapter 3, verse 64. If you can memorize that verse, in Arabic, learn the translation. It is like the basis of competitive, competitive religion, where Allah says, come, come, let us reason. When you are reasoning, reasoning you are meet, meeting a middle ground. You know, you are learning about New Testament, Old Testament, what the Quran says. So that is a basis, I think, for me. Maybe there are other verses that you can relate to, but for me, when Allah says to the Prophet Kul, tell them, come. Ta'alo, come, let us reason. Reason. And uh, the, uh, the things that we mentioned about a dai, that you must have a good character, you must be patient, and so on. And <coughs> it opens up opportunities for you. When you ask questions, the guy, he might not know about Islam, you share with him. Uh, you, know, you might not know about much about Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and so you share and knowledge, you are coming to common terms between us and them, us and them, and uh, you are meeting them on a middle ground. So you can uh, be on the way, way to success that when you are reasoning with them. Then I think the Islamic organization have pamphlets, booklets, you know, there are booklets they give, I think uh, the students will get packages about, uh, on, on the subject matter that the organization uh, deals with. You can share. You can say, have you, sir, have you read this book? You say, have you read this book? He says, no, no, I haven't. So you give it to him. Because people love reading. You know, the first instruction, ikra, read. And I said, the Muslim will say, la ikra, no, no, I won't read. We lack, as students that you have just come in now, welcome to the program, we are speaking about the character traits of a da'i, the one who propagates. Reading as a student, I know many of you will say, I don't want to read, I don't have time. You know, I know that uh, when the teacher gives you an assignment uh, to do a book review, you go read the summary, or you go watch a movie, am I right? You go watch a movie, or you put on Facebook, YouTube, you go get the summary and you come to the class and you do uh, the book review and this is what happened there and you tell a story about the book. But when you read the book, you will have a better understanding about characters in the book. In the Holy Quran, there are 25 prophets mentioned by name. You know, Moses, the prophet of God, is mentioned 136 times in the Quran and 85 times in the Bible. Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned 25 times. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, is mentioned four times as Muhammad and one time as Ahmad. Total of five, the praised one. So when you read things, 
you, you can share it to somebody and say, I didn't know that. When I read, I didn't know that. So you can, one thing, you, people will respect you for that. Say, I didn't know that Moses is mentioned 136. Why will the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon, go out of his ways? Or why will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go out of his ways and say Moses and Moses and Isa, Isa the Maryam, the son of Mary, the son of, why, why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was presenting a case for these prophets. You know, when you go to court, you must produce evidence. He's presenting a case for the, uh, the misunderstanding that the Ahlul Kitab had of these great prophets. You know, things have been diluted. Things have been changed. So he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents a case in the Quran. Prophet Muhammad is talking about Moses, about David, about Solomon. You know, all the great prophets. So when you read, you can share one thing. And as I said, you can do, share one idea with somebody and it will become a book. One idea, when, a, when an author, when he's beginning to write a book, he's got an idea. He's got an idea about something. And it becomes a bestseller. Everybody wants to read. So your idea, everyone that is here today that's listening on social media are unique. Everyone is unique, remember that. There are things that you have, I may, be, I may have a shortcoming. There are things that I have, you may not have. So everyone is unique in that you have this ability, Allah has given you this. He's given you this knowledge. He's given you this ability. He's given you this talent to share this beautiful kalam. That is the purpose of, 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 of a Muslim, of an individual. Yeah? To worship Allah. And how do you worship? I was explained to you last week that you have to be of some service to man. And very, very important. Very, very important that you have to be some service to mankind. And that will elevate your status in this world and in the hereafter. So that is another way in which you can uh, do dawah is through uh, social media. Uh, things like you ask individuals, uh, what is bothering you? It's something you must be wondering. You know, in your in in your interactions with Muslims, there's something that is at the back of your mind uh, that is uh, is always bothering you. And I see girls here uh, with the hijab. You know, Alhamdulillah. You know, you look uh, so beautiful. You have the the light when you put. When, for example, I'm going to give you an example. If you see a hijab lady walking in Grey Street, and you go to the beach with a little with a lady sitting with a skimpily dressed outfit with a bikini, which one, as a man, will look first? Which one? Will you give that hijab lady a second look? Never. And I said last time that the things that men love most is women. I see there's lots of uh, girls and women yet, right? The thing that loves, that uh, man is allured to, that's most alluring to man is women. So when you go to the beach, no matter you are 80, pastor, pope, you're going to look. You're going to look. You're going to look because... Uh, it's a nature of man, but the hijab woman, you're going to give a second look. And none, you look down. You look down, you will never give her a second look because she's dressed up like Mary, the mother of Jesus. You go to a church, you see Mary covered up. So when you explain these things to people, you say, no, we didn't know that. We didn't know that. So these are the things that you have to be armed uh, and so on. Then you have speaking on public levels and so on, using media. I think we're going to go for a short break. Is it? Uh, Abdul Khalid? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, inshallah, when we come back, we'll have a short break. I think I spoke for over an hour. Uh, we'll have a small break. Inshallah, we'll, we'll continue with the talk. Jazakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think we needed that short break. Uh, inshallah, we're going to continue with our, our series. Uh, just um, 
about the greeting, you know, and about the hat. I see some brothers have a hat. And, uh, you know, they say if the label shows intent to wear it. See, the girls are geared up with the hijabs. Some brothers are wearing the hat. And uh, I remember the sheikh was telling me a story um, that he, he used to love picking up hitchhikers. If you know, Brother Iqbal Abdul Khalik will tell you, he loved because that conversation in the car was like a, like a preparation for a bigger platform. You know, I said, as you can do dawah, you can use the bus, the train. He used to love picking up hitchhikers. So he says to me, one day, I was on the, I was somewhere, yeah, I think in Quarry Road, which is area outside Durban, and I saw this brother at a distance, and I made up my mind that I'm going to give this guy a lift. So I stopped, I had a Volkswagen, I stopped, picked him up, and as we are driving, so I'm telling the brother, did you know why I gave you a lift? Do you know why? The guy says, you know me? He said, no, I don't know you. He said, did you know why, or do you know why I gave you a lift? He says, no, I don't know. He said, because you had your bus fare on your head. You had the topi. <laughs> you had your hat. If the label shows intent, wear it. A firefighter, a policeman has a uniform, and the uniform of the Muslim to identify is a hat. The guy says, hey, that guy is a Muslim. Don't mess with that guy. <laughs> he, is, he knows he's got knowledge maybe you don't have. So the guy will be, you know. So the chances of you getting help on the road, anyway, if you got the hat, a sympathetic brother will say, hey, my brother, Salaam Alaikum, how are you? You know, Salaam, when you greet each other, the Quran says, when you greet each other, meet it with something that is, or you meet each other with greeting, something that is better or equal. Always, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Because it's an opening, an opportunity to have discussions. You can share, no, you can network just by the label, the hat, that this is my brother in Deen, is my brother in this world and in the hereafter. So if you are ashamed and you don't want to wear the hat, and it's your prerogative. But I said the chances of you getting help, the chances of you meeting your brother is greater when you wear that label. So I say by way, by just by my observation, I just saw the brothers are wearing the hat. Alhamdulillah, if the label shows intent, wear it. So we're just going to conclude with some of the ways in which we can do da'wah is uh, through YouTube. I think uh, right now, uh, this lecture series, and alhamdulillah, we have many other speakers that will in the course of the weeks. I think the course will run from now till December. And uh, it is good to have variety. You know, listen to the same guy, it's become monotonous. You have variety. So he, each person will have an input into this uh, course. You know, diversity, people from diff different backgrounds. I was telling Brother Iqbal that um, uh, we're having, uh, I think, on. Uh, 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 African traditional uh, tradition. I said it's better to bring a brother from ba that background because diamond cuts diamond. You know that? You must remember that diamond cuts, it takes a sharper thorn to remove a thorn. Remember that. You can't go to an audience and you ramble one way about, about matters. Guys, who, who is this guy? But you bring one of their own, one of their own brothers, he says, this guy can relate. He'll feel at ease that he's my brother. This guy can talk to him. You see, Zulu, I'm not equipped to speak Zulu. Now and then I can speak Fanagalo Zulu, you know, to get away. So we'll have, we'll have diversity, inshallah, for the course uh, to come. So as I said, you can use YouTube, what we are doing right now. Uh, and I think uh, I'm not so uh, uh, clued up with YouTube channels. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, I think I use that platform. Uh, WhatsApp, which is very, very good, uh, provided the students you got data. <laughs> if you don't have data or data, then you will not be able to open up those videos uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Right, so there are many 
innovative ways in which you can uh, do dawah. Uh, uh, one of the very, very important skill I would suggest uh, to the organization is to introduce the students to, a, uh, to the Dale Carnegie course on public speaking. I went for a few, and believe you me, it is worth, as an individual, if you are there, it is worth, as an, even if as an individual, you want to study, uh, um, improve your speaking skills, your public platform uh, uh, lectures, go for that course. Very, very important. Um, it's, I think, Dale Carlegie, uh, an inspirational, motivational talk. Go and do a course. Our school, I think, it offers it. And I think it, uh, you can log on, check, go and do a course. It will help you tremendously because you must have the art of speaking. You must. Otherwise, people will not want to listen to this guy. They'll teach you how to catch fish. You see, salesmen... A good salesman, he can sell shampoo to a bald man. A good salesman. Because he knows what, how to go about. You know the insurance guy, I'm not promoting insurance, he's there, he's a master salesman. He can tell you things that you didn't know about. So they go for courses on Dale Carnegie, the evangelist, the, motive, uh, the guy that preaches. He goes for courses to improve because he's representing something that you don't know. He wants to sell you an item that you might not buy. But by the end of the talk, you bought. As I said last time, the, uh, uh, there was a guy who gave a talk about the existence of God. But at the end of the talk, when they asked him, he said, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. So they asked him, but what do you mean? He said, no, I was paid to do this. They paid me to speak about the existence. And he convinced the people about the existence of a creator. So the art of speaking is very, very important. Right? Because how you uh, present a case. I think this is uh, one of the things that uh, the center has. Is with, they brought in guest speakers, the free meals. <laughs> yeah, students, when I was a student at college, we used to look for free meals. You know, free. Where's the free meal? That masjid, they're, give, they're giving meals after the Juma. We'll go there because the meals are on the house because we were on a tight budget. You know, as a student, you're always scavenging in your pockets, would lose change. So the free meals is like an incentive to draw people. And generally, anything free, people will queue up. A store that's opening, ten, first 10 customers free. That line has got a thousand people for ten items, because the, cus the marketing strategy is to bring that 990 people in, and they will, they will be impulse buying. People will buy. When you go to the supermarket, observe this. When you go to the supermarket, you will notice that the things on the media, on your eye level, is the things that they want to sell. You catch your eye. So when you look, you scan the things that are in the middle, is there to catch. You buy. You won't look down. You may have a bad back. Your C5, C6 is troubling. I can't bet. You just give a scan. You'll buy the shelf. You go to the casino. I'm not promoting casino. They pump in oxygen. They pump in oxygen to keep you awake, alert, because they want what's in your wallet. Then they have bright lights in the casino so that you are not conscious of day and night. You're not conscious because they know the psychology of man, how he, he behaves. Bright lights, the guy doesn't know day or night. Oxygen keeps you awake and alert. You, 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 two o'clock morning, three o'clock, the guy is gambling. But remember, Quran says, Bismillah rahman Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, innam al khamru wal maysiru, most certainly intoxicants. Gambling is an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Shun such abomination that you will prosper. Remember, that is very, very clear. So no sense you are preaching something and you are doing the other thing. You know, many people have uh, fallen short. You know, if you look around, 
in social media, you find preachers, scholars, they have fallen. They have fallen. So I think the center has is, uh, is done a very, very good work. We must thank the organizers because this is something that we need. Right. Uh, we're continuing. Um, I'm going to speak, draw your attention to the different uh, religions of the world. You know, we might be uh, looking at things through blinkers. We think maybe my neighbor is a Hindu, my across the neighbor is a Christian, or I work for Jews, you know, and so on. And uh, you might be looking at things like one dimension, you know, just left, right, front. But there are other religions in the world. When you travel, believe you me, when you travel, I haven't traveled. I've been around South Africa, but when you travel from experiences of my friends and colleagues, when you travel, you'll see the world through different eyes, through different glasses, how people live, how they behave. Like my, there's my bro I just met a brother from Somalia, in Sh Alhamdulillah, we brothers in faith. So I was telling him, uh, some of my good friends are from Sudan. I told you, and I learned something about tafaddal. You know, be generous. The most generous people from my re uh, review, from my friends from Eritrea, from Egypt, from, they said are the Sudanese. I remember, Kel I think, I read some time back, it bring me about uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Garank. I think so, Colonel, see, I read it. It just popped up in my head when that civil war that was going on. By the way, by the way, Africa, by way of information, Africa has the biggest number of resources in the world. Africa can be a more economically developed country in the world. Liberia has a thing that the world needs called TAN that's used in cell phones. But yet Liberia is one of the poorest nations in the world. Why? Because it is controlled by multinational companies, by puppet governments. When there's corruption, when there's abuse of resources, then the country is lagging behind. It becomes a less economically developed country. Many countries in Africa are still in the traditional society. And the countries in Europe are benefiting from the resources in Africa. The re Africa should have been well ahead in it. When the Europeans conquered Africa, they conquered it for two things, or three things. One is for religion, that's sovereignty over Africa, and the other one was cheap labor, and third was resources. The biggest resources are in Africa, but it is managed poorly. We have governments that are corrupt. Singapore was one of the poorest countries in the world. Singapore. But did you know that Singapore today is in the top HDI rank, the Human Development Index rank. Hi, it's it's an multi, it's in the, it's sort of an advanced country. Why? Because they rooted out corruption. That's all. They rooted the one of the ministers went out on a holiday paid by one of the business guys. They arrested this guy at the airport, locked him in. I think he's got five years or so. And after that, they had wiped out corruption. Singapore just climbed up the HDI index, just climbed up because of corruption. So Africa is faced with all those things. So we, uh, we must understand different cultures, not only in, in our local environment, but when you travel, you will, um, you will learn more. So just a recap about comparative religion, the need for that is to call people of other faiths to deen by presenting them the light of Islam to the best of your ability. That is the purpose. That is, that's why we are here today. So the course that we that have conducted so far is introducing you to comparative religion and the, the need for comparative religion and some of the uh, character traits as a da'i, the one who's presenting the case for Islam. Uh, and this will, inshallah, help you to present Islam in a better and nobler way. Um, because many people have a misunderstanding about this deen. So your case is too clear. 
is to clear the minds. You know, the minds are fogged about something, some perception is Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are oppress the women, and so on. We need to know how to present the case for Islam. When you are doing that, you are defending the name of Muhammad Sallallahu You are defending him because it all boils down to the Prophet. That your prophet said this, and your prophet said that, and your prophet said this. It all works. So you, as a representative of that, uh, of this uh, cause, of this um, uh, institution, you are actually being a uh, presenting a, a defense for him in defense of Muhammad. That's what you are doing. Okay, I think now we, we're going to move on to. Uh, the different okay the different types of religion you know there are so many that uh, even I had to go and do a refresher course okay we've done uh, comparative religion let's, let's just see where uh, we are in now. societies uh, religion played a role in cultural life uh, uh, with symbols, with rituals, uh, in material, in artistic culture, literature, storytelling, painting, music, dance. You go to different cultures. For example, you go to Pakistan. There are Muslims there, but you see something different from the South African Muslim or from the um, uh, American Muslim. They have different cultural practices, you know. So sometimes it might feel offensive to some Muslims, and sometimes it's the norm of the day. So different ways of presenting uh, is Islam. Would some use music? You know, some say that's taboo. But you have to look at the diverse backgrounds of people. We are not all living in South Africa, you know. Like for example, uh, the question of racism. You see, the Zulu, everyone is a racist. Everyone. But the, as Muslims, we try to be least racist because the Quran has a system. Five times a day, we pray side by side, the black and the white, the Chinese and the Malay, everyone side by side, we pray to remove the devil. The Mulana will say, Imam will say, straighten yourselves, you know, don't leave any gaps. Gaps for what? The gaps of the devil of racism, of discrimination. You see the Zulu, they say Isu Zulu. What is Isu Zulu? What is it? It's heavenly people. The people from the heavens. And the rest is Isilwane. He's a creature. Am I right? The Toza, the Sutu, he is below us. The he Zulu is above. So he's also racist. So Islam has a system. He has a system to, we are all racist, all. We have a system to minimize that racism. You go to that culture, you say, I'm better. You go to that, I'm better. And believe you me, you go to any culture, you go to any culture, the language, you go to, Bang, uh, to Sri Lanka, you know they speak that language, I think they speak Tamil, I'm not sure, but they speak a language I heard uh, them speaking, to them it is the most beautiful language on the face of the earth. To any society, their language is the most beautiful. We say Urdu, that guy say Afrikaans, we say Hindi. The language of any culture or society is the most beautiful. Most beautiful. You know, by way of correction, sometimes Deliberately, when I'm quoting, I'll make an error. I'm just by way, I'm just telling you about the Quran, about Arabic. So I'll make a, deliberately, I'll just make an error in my quotation. And um, at the end of it, you, and, and alhamdulillah, the miracle of the Quran is this is the only book on the face of the earth that can be memorized, this book. Only book. And I'm sure there are people that are sitting here who are studying uh, Hives, there are alimas here, or, or you know of somebody that has memorized the Quran. So deliberately, I'll make a mistake. So at the end of the talk, the Hafiz will come and say, my brother, you made a mistake in your quotation. 
and this is the pronunciation or this is how it should be read. I said, you are right. Because I want to prove that the miracle nature of the Quran. So in my next talk, I'll narrate, I'll say, hey, I was there and this is what happened and I presented the case and out of there, there were 20 hufas. They were listening and one guy came and it happened. Many times I do that. I'll misquote. Uh, instead of saying ah, I'll say e. The guy said you misquote to prove the miracle nature of the Quran. You know, since we are talking about language, the miracle nature of the Quran. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I said before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to every nation on the earth, in some point in history, a messenger. Because I was asked, why didn't God just send one prophet, one book? It makes it difficult now. You know, you're sending the Zabur, the Injil, the Torah, you send the Al-Quran, and there are many other revelations we don't know. We don't know. Only 25 prophets are mentioned by name. Some, in, I think in Sahih Bukhari, they say about 125,000 messengers went out to different parts of the world. Because the message was for the mentality and the psychology of people. Moses, the prophet of the Jews, according to the Old Testament, <clears throat> he came to a people that were steeped in magic. So Allah sent a prophet with magical powers. Jesus, peace be upon him, he was sent to a people that were steeped in Greek medicine. So he sent a prophet with a type of a miracle that challenged the, meds, uh, the doctors of that time. He had healing powers. And Muhammad Sallallahu came to a people that boast, boasted their language. Their language. So he sent a book, the Al-Quran, that was, uh, the, the language could not be compared. You know, the language, what eloquence. They said this is no, you know, when, they, when he was revealed, this is not, nothing but magic and sorcery. They accused him of magic and sorcery. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent messengers to all nations. All nations. Some of them we don't know. You know, you say, but India, they got uh, Ram, Krishna. Who are they? We don't know. We don't know where Allah's who, where, and what. But as time goes on, people dilute the message. They, they deify the, the, the messengers. When the messengers pass on, they create uh, an object of worship. Yeah, times have changed. So people say, I remember this person. And this is how he looked, so they begin to worship him. So sometimes messengers were worshipped as, as, uh, as gods. They were, uh, the real message of those messengers were forgotten. So people started to take idols and they started to worship people. So Allah says that to every community, there again in Surah Al-Nahal, chapter 16, uh, um, verse 36, it says, we sent a messenger to every community saying, worship God and such and shun false gods. If you look at Ibrahim a.s. message when he, uh, when he was using wisdom to talk to his people about the stars, when the moon set and the stars disappeared, he was using wisdom. He said, Ya Abati, Will you worship that, that which cannot hear, that cannot see? Ya Abati, Ya Ab oh my father, oh my father. He presented a case to his father, begging him to stop worshipping idols. And what did his father say? Oh, Ibrahim, get away, get away, get away from me. Here is a prophet who is preaching about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is preaching about monotheism, about Tawheed, and his father said, Ibrahim, get away from me. Get away, futsak. You know, the, the, the Afrikaner will say, futsak, go. What better words? Can we speak anything better than Ibrahim alayhi salam? Can we? We can't. Yeah, he's presenting a case, and his father said, get away for a good while, right? before I stone you to death. Before, you, you know, get rid of you. So this is important to know that the messenger, uh, me the message was sent to all, to all people on the uh, face of the earth. So what is religion? 
You know, I was using the example of the people jogging on the beach. I said they, they in the mornings about five, six o'clock when you're going to work, people are jogging religiously. You know, it became a religion. Jogging. And uh, with the pets, animals running up, down, walking. If you go to the beach, you see people, everyone, all races. You know, they're jog walking, jogging, improving their lifestyle, exercising. So what is religion? These notes, inshallah, because it will be difficult for you to take down everything, I think they will be made accessible to you so you can peruse through that notes. And then, uh, inshallah, you'll have a... The idea is for you to have a foundation on comparative religion. So once you build a foundation, you know what, you are, what your mission is. What is your purpose? So religion is a set of beliefs and practices held by a group of people. Okay? So for thousands of years, people have searched for the meaning and truth of their own nature and of the universe and the religions which deal with the whole of human life and death. Okay, so we know as Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent one religion. If you ask Moses, the prophet of the Jews, if you had the chance in the second coming, if you ask him, he says, oh Moses, what is your religion? I do not expect him to say Judaism. I don't expect him. Because Judaism was a term coined uh, by Judah, the son of Jacob, the eldest son of Jacob. So they lived in a place called Judea. There were 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. So Judah was the eldest son of Jacob. So they lived in an area known as Judea. So people that were looking at them, they said, these are the children of Judah living in Judea, and the religion they practice is Judaism, the followers of Judah. If you look at uh, what I'd expect him to say, what I'd expect Moses to say, that my religion is a religion of total submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because remember I quoted the Shama, Shama Israelu aduna ila haino edna echad. He says, Yo, uh, Israel, your Lord God is one. Uh, so I would expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to Allah, and one word for that is Islam. If you look at the life of Christ, you see he, um, it was Paul in the book of Acts, chapter 11, Paul, uh, in a place in Antioch, where the Christians disparage, or the uh, people in Antioch were looking at the followers of Christ disparagingly. They said, these are the followers of Christ. They are Christians. So in his lifetime, Jesus peace never heard the word Christian. In his life, he didn't hear the word. It was at Antioch where disparagingly people point, these are the followers of Christ, and they are Christians. If I had the chance in the second coming to ask him, I said, oh, Jesus, peace be upon you, what is your religion? And he will give me the exact words, exact words of Moses, Shama Israelo, Aduna Ila Haino, Aduna Echad. He says, Yeah, O Israel, your Lord God is one. And if you go further, he say, My religion, my religion, if I had the chance of asking him in the second coming, he said, My religion is a religion of total submission to God, and one word for that is Islam. So all prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sent prophets to all nations, he sent the message of La ilaha illallah. That's it. That's it. And over time, it has become adulterated, it has become diluted to suit the people. Today, religion is suiting, people have become selective of what is good and what is bad. It suits their lifestyle. If you look at for example, 50 years ago, if you look at the churchgoers that go to church, they all dressed modestly. Look at the Hindu lady with the scarf, cover. Today, if you look at them, it's like, it's like a ramp, models on the ramp. You look around. You go to, to institutions, 
they don't follow the teachings. They don't follow it. It has been changed to suit the needs of, uh, or, uh, to suit your lifestyle. You have tailor-made religion to suit your lifestyle. So, so we look at religions as communities of people who, show, who share practices and beliefs often in God or gods and assemble in special buildings for worship and meditation. I think there's a church across the, um, the next to the masjid, the Grey Street Masjid, there's a church there. And I know many schools, uh, they take their children, because children don't know the concept of religion. They don't have a vision. Children are lost. If you ask any child, if you ask any child, even a Muslim child, the environment that I'm coming, by grade five, he stops going to madrasa. He stops going to madrasa. You ask the other child from a different background, he said, no, I don't, I didn't go. I didn't go to, uh, to, to vernacular classes. The schools are introducing uh, subjects like uh, Hindi, Urdu, to bring back people, to bring back people uh, to their belief system because children are lost. So sometimes the guy is a supposed Christian. He made, the youngster didn't go to the church. He said, I don't go to the church. My parents go. So we have lost that, uh, that touch with children. And in, amongst the Muslim community, we also have fallen short. He reached grade four or five, and his mother said, no, too much homework. Or he got cricket practice today. I'm being honest there, I got cricket practice. Or uh, Friday he can't go for Juma because he's gone for something. He got to play soccer. It's happening. We are losing touch with our roots. And we want to know why our children are rebelling against us. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Every good tree will bear good fruits and every evil tree will bear evil fruit. He tests them. So if you as a parent, you need to strategize now. You need to refocus, reorganize. It's the, most, the children of today are the future generation. Whether it be Hindu, Christian, we are losing them. They're going to atheism, devil worship. You know, they're lost. They don't know what to believe in. They believe in the devil. They put tattoos, you know, on their bodies, belong to a certain group, cult. Children, they follow a certain lifestyle. So we have to make our, conscientize our people. Masjids, we have the masjids. Emphasize children, you go read your salah. The, um, our schools organize trips to the uh, uh, to the, uh, I think to the temples, to the uh, uh, churches, to the masjid. I think even the IPCI does uh, tours to the masjid. It's good. You're exposing people. People don't know. They don't know how people pray. They don't know. The Christian doesn't know. He doesn't know how the Muslim. When you show him, he said, "Wait a minute." But this is how. Jesus prayed, prayed in Matthew 26, 36, and Jesus fell on his face and he prayed, like the Muslim. And Abraham fell on his face, and Joshua fell on his face. All the prophets, they fell on their faces. It's nothing new. We as a die, we need to tell them, these are the things that the Muslims do. It's there in your book. We're not telling them. And Daniel, he prayed three times a day in the book of Daniel. How do you pray? You fall on your face. You know, they say your head's down, bums up. You know, they say, you go to the mother, what is funny posture? Heads down, the intellect. When you put the intellect, the thing that your seat of intelligence to the ground, you humble yourself. That is the salah. When you put this, you think you're too smart, you're too clever. The intellect is in the ground, in the dust. It brings you down. You bring it down. And remember, I, I always, as a da'i, you must remember this. I always, the, the sheikh always told me, there is always a khidr out there. You know what it means, khidr? The story of khidr al-Islam? You go read about when Musa al-Islam wanted to know about uh, who is 
you know, great. Is there anyone knowledgeable? So Allah directed him to Khidr, who was more knowledgeable than Musa alayhi salam. So you, if you think you're smart, there is Khidr out there who's smarter than you. You think you're a great footballer, there's a Khidr footballer. You think you're a great da'i, there's Khidr. You're a great mechanic, there's Khidr. There's somebody always better than you. You're a gangster, there's Khidr gangster. There's somebody greater than you. If you think you're pretty, there's another Khidr <laughs> greater than you. So you must always remember that there is always a Khidr as a da'i. Somebody who's better. Humble yourself. When you go to Salah, it teaches you about humility. This one, yeah, the highest part above your heart. In fact, inshallah, when I have a chance, I will speak to you about the intelligent heart. The heart has its own level of intelligence. We think the intelligence is here. It's in the heart as well. So remember that when you're presenting your case, you have to speak that this is no different from all. But we have religions in which we have to respect as well. When we know the religions, when we get in there, study about them, then we have, we reach common grounds. You know, ta'alo, come, let us reason. So you say that this is there in my book, it's there in my book. So you reach common grounds and, and it is a very sensitive issue. <clears throat> very, very sensitive, you know. You can become like that McGregor guy, you know, in the boxing match, that guy that what, uh, that uh, cage fighting, he's rough. You can be like that in the field of Dawa, or you can be like the other guy. What's his name from, Kos, uh, what's his name? Khabib. You can be like Khabib humble, like that. You can be McGregor, you will get knocked out. You will get knocked out, but you will, that Khabib, you will rise. You will rise at the day. You, because it's a sensitive, very, very, when you study all these other religions, and they're at your fingertips. You just Google. You know, today you can find a fatwa on Google too. <laughs> you, you know that? People say you can, you can find Mr. Google will give you answers to that. But that's danger. If you don't know anything about Islamic knowledge, go to the alim, imam, ask him. Because in the social media, there are many mis representations of Islam. It can mislead you. He said, no, I went to this website. Be careful. Find out there are books. There's a bookstore downstairs. Uh, there's bookstores all over. Read, check up, go to sites, test them. You know, test them. So, the history of religion. Anybody knows about Atna too? There's a book written by Sheikh Atna too, The History of Religions. It's the Aboriginal people in Australia. You know, any primitive society, they, they had evidence of some form of worship. And, as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent messengers to all nations. So the Aboriginal people in Australia, they believe in something called Atnatu. What is Atnatu? You heard that before? I'll be honest with you, I read this book in the 90s. I think it's some in the shelf. Yeah, I read about, about the concept of God, you know? Um, and it was written by Sheikh Dina. So I did some research. It is in South Australia, and somebody, a prophet, somebody spoke, I think they have the most purest form of the concept of God. The of people in South Australia, the Aboriginal people, they have something that is pure in the concept of God. And it's called Atna too. If you want to look at what God is, who God is, I think this will be the best description. The Christian has his concept of God, you know, hanging on the cross. We, alhamdulillah, the Muslim, there are 99 attributes of Allah. Allah is Khalik, the creator. He's uncreated. But did you know that of the 99 attributes, oh, okay, jazakallah, there's a book. What is his name? I think you must get this book. 
I think it's very, very. Of the 99 attributes, Ab is not there. Father is not there. But we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That Allah is the Lord of the worlds. Ab is not there. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came to a people, they were different. They were the Jews, the Christians, the hypocrites, the Munafiks, all pointing fingers. And at that time, in, the, in, uh, in Mecca and in Medina, people knew God by the word Father. They say he's the Father in heaven. So it, it is alleged that Prophet Muhammad copied. He copied, and he uh, copied from the Jews and the Christians. But he didn't catch Ab. He didn't catch it. They were saying his father, the word Rabb, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Father is not there. Because when you say that Allah is Father, then what comes into your mind? Think of that man in the Salah. I was telling you, he was reading that four Salah and in the first Rakat where he was. Because your mind conjects, you know, it conjects pictures. You might think uh, God is like uh, Father Christmas. He got a big belly, long nose, big beard, and he's going, you know, ho, 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 with a sledge. You must be thinking like that. Because people's minds, it wanders. We don't know Allah by, the, by Ab. We say Allah is Rabb, He's Khalik, He's Rahman. Of the 99, Father is not there. It's a miracle in itself. So here the, the people in South, the primitive people, they know God by the term Atnatu. You know what Atnatu means? Anybody who read this book? Anybody? You know, Atnatu means that uh, this God, he doesn't go toilet. That's what it means. This God, this concept of God, he doesn't have a backside. You know, when you eat, when you eat, after a good meal, after this meal, yeah, somebody say, ate my stomach, now I need to go relieve myself. That God, somebody programmed them that this God does not have the need to go to toilet. I must put it crudely. He does not have the call of nature. He does not eat. He cannot, befit, he, it will be not befitting to call God by that who, person who eats. Who eats. So he has an, a digestive system. When you eat, it must digest. Then you get a thing called hostration. And I remember some doing some uh, physiology at the university. I remember that question, it came out in the, more, in the exams, hostration. That in the morning when you have something to eat, then your stomach starts to work. When it starts to work, then you must run toilet. Can you imagine God running to the toilet? Eh? Running to the toilet, looking for a bush or a rock. is not befitting God. It's these primitive people, they say, Atnatu, the one that does not have an excretory system. You learn about skeletal system, digestive system, security system, all the systems. If you're going to become a doctor, you must know the systems. And remember the word I said, hostration. Your stomach rumbles, then you are looking for a toilet. God is not like that. He's atna too. Because the Quran says, the Quran says very clear, it is Allah who feeds. It is Allah who feeds and is not fed. Simple. He's talking about atna too. Chapter 6, verse 14. Is Allah who feeds and is not fed. And if you look at the life of Jesus, he ate. You know, it is. Suppose crucifixion, he ate. You know, when he came back to the upper room and his disciple, disciples were affrighted, they were scared to see him walking. He said, have you any, anything to eat? To prove what? To prove what? That if he's going to eat, he's going to go to toilet. When he goes to toilet, it's ill-befitting the quality attribute of God. So we, when we read and we empower ourselves, when we look at this, Traditional society is teaching us about the concept of God because unto every nation God has sent a messenger. Right, then we have different religions. I think I'm just going to introduce 
due to the different religion. And inshallah, when we come back, inshallah, the next time they can elaborate. And um, I have learned that in every religion it teaches, in every religion it teaches us good. Some of my video clips are from Buddhism, the story of Buddha. I'm going to come to that. Some of it is from Hinduism to inspire and motivate people, you know, that I'm not going to only just say the, the Quran says this and that book says, I use all different, integrate all to reach a middle ground. Right, so religion, there are classifications of religion and it says yeah, according to Charles Joseph Adams, a very senior uh, professor of the Islamic studies at McGill University for almost 20 years, and he says that the classification discerns the main group of religions as followers. Okay? Number one, Middle Eastern religions, including Judaism, as I spoke to you earlier on, that how Judaism came about, how Christianity, Islam, Christianity, Islam, and a variety of ancient cults. Then you have the East Asian religions that you find in China, Japan, Korea, of Confucianism, uh, Daoism, uh, and uh, Buddhism, Shinto. You can, you can learn so much from these different religions. It'll help and empower you to become a better individual. Uh, then you have the Indian religions also include Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, and Zoroastrianism. Uh, and then sometimes also the Theravada, the way of elders, which includes Buddhism and Hindu. Um, I was invited as a guest speaker twice to Sai Baba. You heard of Sai Baba? He's got a following in India, uh, and the devotees uh, are called Sai's, S-A-I. You'll see number plates. You'll see the number, you know, you get personalized plates in, in Durban, you'll see Sai Zeden, Om Sai Zeden. They follow a leader, a spiritual guide, right, if you want to study more. So I went, they invited me, they said we need, it was a 60th anniversary, and they said we want to, to talk on, uh, from an Islamic per perspective, and I spoke about Muhammad the Greatest. <laughs> I spoke about Muhammad the Greatest, about his character, about his life, and Alhamdulillah, it was so well, because they didn't know. They didn't know. At that time, it was that 9-11 attacks. They thought this guy is going to come with a terror, you know, he's going to stand here with some, you know, missiles here with swords, and he's going to, he's going to propagate to us some the ideology. You know, the guy, the, the priest said, he said, I never knew that Islam is such a beautiful religion. I used their platform because there was something that I said tickled them in their hearts. And they said, no, bring this guy, we want to hear. So I spoke about Muhammad, Salam, the greatest, and what we learned. And it was well received. They said, are you free again for the next conference? And I went again. I spoke about elements of success. Alhamdulillah. It went so well that they said, when they, they <laughs> said, whenever you are free, please come and... Okay, so I went in Ramadan. I went in Ramadan and I spoke to, uh, after, if, after the iftar, I went, I broke my fast, I went and I, they waited for me, I gave a talk on Ramadan. I said, Ramadan teaches the Muslims about punctuality. You know, I see the girls came late, maybe there was some traffic or bus broke down or the Uber didn't, but as a da'i, you must be punctual. You must be punctual. I always say punctuality is very, very important. Very important. So I said that Ramadan teaches the Muslims about punctuality. No Muslim breaks his fast after the azan. You can hear the speaker, you know. You can hear the imam is adjusting. The guy is ready with the samosa. He's ready with the milkshake. He's ready. He said, come on, man, come on. And just by the, you know, as the imam takes his breath, he's making his dua and uh, he breaks his fast. Ramadan teaches you about punctuality. But in functions as Muslims, you know, the local Muslim, they, we're not punctual. There's a wedding the bride comes late. 
I said, the guy, even for your funeral, you'll be late. <laughs> you know, you're always late. Even for your funeral, you'll be late. We have to wait for you to come and <laughs> bury you. You'll be somewhere in between heaven and hell. I don't know. So Islam teaches you about punctual. When you go, when you venture into these religions, alhamdulillah, you'll find Islam. Wallahi, you'll find Islam. You say, hey, wait a minute. This is the teachings of Prophet Muhammad. When you venture, you go and study, you see, about, uh, about Buddhism. Hey, wait a minute, this is teaching about Islam. About Hinduism. This is teaching about Islam. Islam, Islam. We don't know because we don't have the weapons. We don't know. We have a narrow vision. Keep them out. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was in, in Makkah, the Quraysh drew a circle to keep him out. You know that? They said, keep this guy out. He's going against our teachings, against our norms. So they drew a circle and they kept him out. When the Prophet saw that, he made a bigger circle to draw them in. That's what he did. That is how he spread Islam. He brought them in, he tolerated, he forgave. Forgiveness in Islam is one of the, one of the I think, it's the most humblest thing to do is to forgive your brother. Wallahi, you forgive. That is what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did. When he forgave, you know, Mecca came to his feet, literally. You know, he conquered Mecca without a sword, without, a, without even lifting the sword, he conquered Mecca. When you do, as I said, when you do a prophet's job, you will earn a prophet's reward. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my field that the respect and the honor that you get. I'm a teacher. It, it may not be seem a noble profession, but I say it is the noblest profession that you can get to be a teacher because Prophet Muhammad was the greatest of teachers of all times. What we hear, what we see is the greatest teacher, that you are changing the lives. You know how many children I meet on the streets, they still call me a doctor. He says, sir, how are you? Sir, how are you? It humbles you. He says, sir, you remember you taught us something in grade four. I will never forget that. And we got the Quran, the life of Prophet Muhammad, so many things he has inspired us with, we can never forget him. The name Muhammad is the number one name in UK right now. Every child is born Muhammad, 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 number one name to give a child is Muhammad. How? How is about the, the character of Muhammad? He forgave, he preached, he tolerated, he turned the other cheek, you know, in situations, in the environment in which he was. He was playing the role of a da'i. He was able to, you know, to respond to the challenges that was thrown to him. And Islam went from one, two, three, four, over a million people, over a billion people subscribed to La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasul. Why? Because of the dictates of Muhammad. That's simple. A man and his mission, without the sword, he conquered. Nations were conquered. Nations were conquered. So... I think we will conclude here. So these are some of the religions. The notes are there. You can, uh, you can peruse through that. You will get a better understanding. And then you just can Google about Shintoism. You punch in there. Learn about their lifestyle. You learn. You say, this is Islam. This is what Islam teaches. Hinduism. This is what Islam teaches. There may be things that we... We, we, may not, we may disagree on from the Bible, from scriptures, but look at the lifestyle. I said the purpose, when the Allah says that you worship, that he has created man, the jinns and man, to worship him. Find out what is your purpose in life. How are you going to create an impact on the people? With these words, Wama alina illal balahul mubin. I spoke for so many, I think I, over two hours now. I think... Uh, if you have any questions, you can bring it to me or we can chat one on one. And uh, believe you me, I don't know the answers to everything. I'm a student like you. I learn every day. I study for one hour. And uh, you have to be consistent. You study one hour, tomorrow will be two hours. Next day will be three hours. By the week you put it, you might, uh, in a year, you might complete like a degree in comparative religion. If you are sincere and you are focused, you, become, you can become a didat. You can become a didat. You think that you see the videos 
uh, they, this man, uh, just like that, years of practice, picking up hitchhikers, sitting in the office, practicing. He says, watch and learn. He said, watch and learn. So I should watch his videos. He said, with the eyes, he said, watch, watch, watch. So what he's saying is you have to, to, to become a better speaker, you must sharpen the tongue. And the way you do that is, is you talk. You talk. My wife said, I always talk too much. So <laughs> I said, I have to, to sharpen the tongue. Maybe there are mistakes in my shortcomings in, in delivering the talk. I ask you to forgive me because I'm also a student like you. Um, so are, are there any questions? In Islam, we must compete with each other in good deeds, not in dunya things. You know, I got a car, hey, we buy a Mercedes, hey, buy a BM. Hey, they bought, they bought, bought the car with drug money. No, you compete with each other in, with good deeds. If I kept an orphan, you keep two. You know, the problems of orphanage of orphans can be solved if everybody adopts one. The Prophet will, inshallah, he will come and meet you. Not today, but on the day of uh, reckoning, he will come and say, congratulations, you have reached the promised land, as the Christian would say. You have reached. So do compete with each other in good deeds. Not major deeds, good deeds. Simple things. Honor thy neighbor. Take care of your parents. As I said, my Coming here is the du'as of my parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them a high status in Jannat al firdaus They were always honored. My father and mother said that you will go far in your, in, your, in your career and in this work. And alhamdulillah, by me standing here today, I have reached another level. And uh, I think I've got students from all over listening. And uh, with your du'as, it will go great. And there may be students here amongst you that will be a didat. That will be the next Zakir Naik or the next scholar, a great, you know, of the of the of, of our times. Eloquence. Have you seen the American preacher speak? Farrakhan, Siraj Wahaj, you must hear them speak. Allah has given them that speech, that gift of the speech. The major, amazing. Is this a check? <laughs> It says, yeah, how can a Muslim deliver a message to a Christian person uh, by saying the Muslims and the Christians are the same? In the fundamental teachings, in the fundamental teachings between the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews, there isn't an iota of difference. In the fundamentals. The, if you look at um, uh, the, the prayer, if you look at all three books, all, Joshua fell on his face, Jesus fell on his face, and Abraham and Aaron, they fell on his face. When they do the mosque tours here, when they do the mosque tours here, you'll see that, uh, I think some of the brothers involved, they'll show you step by step using the Old Testament, New Testament, using uh, Sai Bukhari and teaching you how to pray, how to pray. It brings you the different Circumcision. You know, circumcision amongst all Jews, Christians, and Muslims is, is compulsory. It's, comp it's there. Jesus said, think, that not, think not that I've come to change the law of Moses and the prophets. I've come to fulfill. What Moses did, modern day Christian doesn't do. Circumcision prevents cervical cancer. Circumcision prevents AIDS transmission. Did you know that? Today is ABC squared. Abstinence, be faithful, condomize, and circumcise. Did you know that circumcision uh, is compulsory to prevent AIDS transmission? Nelson Mandela, A Long Walk to Freedom, I read the book. He's saying about circumcision. Did you know that causes they circumcise? He's saying in his book, A Long Walk to Freedom, he says, at the age of 16, I underwent ritual circumcision. I looked down and I saw a perfect cut, clean like a ring. I count the manhood days from the day I was circumcised. Circumcision is all there. We're not telling them. Prayer, fasting, pork. 
Thou shalt not eat the flesh of the swine. People eat. I advise all my friends who are uh, Christian. I said, don't eat pork. Many of the women suffer with breast cancer. There are so many diseases in eating the flesh of the swine that science don't, don't even know now, up till now. So don't eat pork. So they got prayer, you got fasting, you got the diet. It's all Muslim, Muslim. Even in the teachings, in the Shama, is the same. So you can, but sometimes I know people will have, will say, yeah, but that's your point of view. We believe, but that's your point of view. But you remember, once you have planted the seed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the rest. You have created something, a doubt. You say, how does this child know? How does this child know? So I think, uh, so those are some of you speak about the similar. When you get into the difference, you're going to get boxing match. You know, they're going to box you. Know, hey, you know, now you're being insensitive. And you know, like you, you speak about the common things. There are so many common things that you can learn. And you can share it. Even you can share it with me too. I will learn. I'm, I'm learning every... I learn from children. I, le I learn from grade four children about uh, doing da'wah. There are certain things they tell me and I just pick it up and I start elaborating on that. So there are many things that you as a, uh, a da'i can do and you can learn. Okay, I think... Khalid Jazakallah.